This is a new day. This is a new day full of sound and light and expectation. This day has been waiting for you. This day has been waiting especially for you. To embrace you. To guide you. This day has been waiting with open arms. Just for you. This is the day we have been given. Let's not waste it. Come now and let us worship together. Please rise. Embody your spirit for our first hymn, hymn 396. This is a beautiful hymn written by a minister who's now serving in Oberlin, Ohio. I know this rose will open. Come, come with an open mind, a loving heart, and willing hands. Come, for you are welcome here. Not that stink bug, though. Sorry, everybody. Sorry. You're welcome here, no matter your age, the number of legs you have, your size, the color of your hair, the color of your skin or eyes. Come, whatever your abilities, whomever you love, we welcome all people of goodwill traveling on the road of religious exploration. My name is Sarah Lown. I want to extend a special welcome for to those of you who are with us for the first or second time, we invite you to take a packet, which is at the back and the welcome table at the door. It looks like this. Or to fill out a connection card, also at the back, like this. Uh, and we will then be able to stay in touch with you. And we also invite you to join us for coffee hour downstairs after the service, where we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have about the church activities and programs. Once again, welcome to UUYO. And we have a couple of announcements. More than, more than a couple, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, I just want to say thank you. There's some real wonderful um, things that have happened this past week that I think you should, all should know about. Um, I don't know if you feel a difference in this sanctuary. Do you feel slightly warmer? Slightly less chilled? Well, that's all thanks to the effort of our board of trustees, specifically Tim Raritan, 
uh, who uh, had a crew put in insulation all throughout here so that we can save heating costs and have a little bit more of a warm experience. So thank you. I'm going to give a round of applause to them for that. Um, I also want to thank um, Thrive Mahoning Valley for hosting a panel on immigration this past Thursday. Um, Gabriel Palmer Fernandez, uh, Chris Colon, uh, Adam Lee, uh, many others who made that happen. Um, it was very powerful hearing firsthand experiences of people who have immigrated to this valley. Um, we're planning to do something in January or February around people who have immigrated here from the Middle East. Um, a lot of families from Palestine have immigrated here during this time. And so we want to talk about that. And so thank you all for that. Um, you'll probably notice all the ribbons outside. Um, I was glad to be part of honoring World AIDS Day. Um, as members came in, they gave me some of the history of their effort around World AIDS Day over the decades here in the Valley. Um, Sarah Lowry was the call to action during that, uh, speaking from the Community Foundation from a health perspective um, about ending stigma and discrimination. So you'll see that up there for probably another week or so, um, just to raise awareness about our love for everyone in this community, uh, including those who have HIV. And um, we have a lot of services this month. I don't know if you've noticed. Uh, we have lots of ways to celebrate. We're going to be celebrating Rahatsu this Sunday, a uh, celebration of the Buddha's enlightenment. We're going to celebrate the winter solstice on the winter solstice. Uh, uh, Christmas Eve is on a Sunday this year. So I tried to skimp you, honestly, a little bit. But get, everyone said, you know, you've got to have two services. So we're going to do two services. We're going to do a service in the morning. We're going to do Blue Christmas uh, service to talk about um, our experience of yearning and loss during this year. I know it's not an easy Christmas for everyone, so we're going to talk about that in the morning. And then 5 o'clock p.m. Christmas Eve candlelight service, uh, which is open to everyone where we can share our joy with each other. And I think that's about it. Um, Elaine Habiger. Would you please offer your fine words and light our chalice? Good morning. Well, I don't understand. I don't understand life. Pretty much everything is a mystery to me. That's our month's topic, mystery. Um, I used to understand things um, when I was younger. I knew so, so much. Some of you might identify with that. <laughs> um, but at this point, I don't understand. It feels like I live in uncertainty overall. Yes, I have what seems like a lot of knowledge and some intellectual understanding, but as far as belief or certainty, no. The question then, I think, is what to do, how to be, in light of all of this uncertainty, in the face of this mystery. I mean, certainly, mystery, but within mystery can be liberation, freedom, comfort. But there can also be fear, and sometimes it is frightening, sometimes it's easy to feel like, well, nothing matters anyway, so whatever. But of course, there are other ways to respond, and a religious community like this is the place to explore different ways to respond to life's big questions. Here at UUIO, we have quite a variety of spiritual perspectives, including followers of one faith or another faith, agnostics, atheists. So within our church community, there's kind of an extra sense of built-in mystery by default, which points to the idea that in the face of mystery, we together create meaning, uh, meaning, and we continually maintain the foundational ideas of this church 
that give us a sense of identity and stability within the great unknown. Our covenant expresses the ideas that in this world of uncertainty and mystery, love is significant. And our covenant suggests that a reasonable response to the mystery and the unknown, the uncertainty, is to serve others. And our covenant states that we will seek the truth in love, not that we'll necessarily find or agree on answers or solve any of the great questions. <laughs> so in recognition of the mystery of life, we light this chalice with a sense of humility and awe, and in acknowledgement that together we create and maintain meaning. We light this chalice with a sense of responsibility and empowerment. Good morning. Our story for today is called Mindful Mr. Sloth, and it's by Katie Hudson. Sasha Patience Pruitt was far from patient. She loved to do things, lots of things, all at once. She had one speed, fast. Early one morning, Sasha raced up to her treehouse, trampling some flowers along the way. She frantically waved her butterfly net around for two seconds and moved on. She had just whipped out her guitar to serenade the birds when she was interrupted by an almighty crash above her head. Sasha scrambled up to the roof to find a sloth. Hello, he said. My name is Mr. Sloth. Mr. Sloth was going to explain how he had fallen from the branch above during his morning nap, but Sasha was too impatient to wait for his story. Come along, Mr. Sloth, she said. We are going to be best friends. I have so much for us to do together. They tried playing doctor, but Mr. Sloth took far too long to find a heartbeat. Sasha decided that Mr. Sloth should be the patient. That worked a little better. They tried building a rocket, but Mr. Sloth was much too slow with the sticky tape. Sasha thought it best that he do a different job. Painting took even longer. Sasha had painted four pictures in the time it took Mr. Sloth to tie on his apron. Come along now, Sasha said, picking up a paintbrush and taking over. There, all done. Grab a helmet, Mr. Sloth. It's time for the neighborhood race. <laughs> Off Sasha and Mr. Sloth sped faster than anyone else in the race. Faster and faster they went until... Stop! hailed Mr. Sloth. What is it? Sasha asked impatiently. Can you hear that bird singing? He asked, beautiful. Sasha paused. The chirping was nice enough, but she had a race to win. She plopped Mr. Sloth back on her bike. Off they sped again, Sasha pedaling fast to catch up until... Stop, moaned Mr. Sloth. With a quick huff, Sasha stopped. What is it now, Mr. Sloth? Can you smell the flowers, he asked. Mm. Sasha sniffed around, pausing a little longer this time. The flowers did smell nice. How had she never noticed that before? But she didn't have time for this. The race was still underway. Helmet back on, Mr. Sloth, she said. Let's go. Off they raced once more, Sasha pedaling as fast as she could until... Stop! wheezed Mr. Sloth. 
Once again, Sasha slammed on the brakes, but before she could ask, Mr. Sloth took off his helmet and whispered, shh. Sasha waited. She took a breath. She felt a tiny breeze. She looked. She listened. All was still. That day, Sasha saw that fun had two speeds, fast and slow. She still liked to go as fast as she could at times, but other times, going slow worked out much better. And just like Sasha had predicted, she and Mr. Sloth became the very best of friends. At the end of every day, they would snuggle together for story time. Mr. Sloth took so long to read the words that Sasha got to enjoy every part of the story more than she ever had before. She even had time to look at the pictures. Of course, they didn't always make it to the end. The end. I'd like the young Padawans, the children, to come up for me, please. Come up. You have it memorized yet. <laughs> Here, take one and pass it. Give me one, too. Come on. <laughs> Hi, Lincoln. How are you? Okay, so we're going we're gonna to lead you in our covenant, and yours is in your order of service. Please read it with us. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. And we are going to sing out again, just like we had been doing. Ready? Okay. Sing along if you remember, and then the second time around, you should have it anyways. Okay? It's number Ready? 413 in the uh, book. If you oh, is it? 413? Yes. Number 413. Yeah. It's called Go Now in Peace. Okay. Go now in peace, go now in peace, may the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Go now in peace, go now in peace, may the spirit of love surround you everywhere everywhere you may go go now in peace go now in peace may the spirit of love surround you everywhere Please greet your neighbor. Just say hello. Just uh, introduce yourself, especially if it's someone you don't know. That would be nice. We now receive the 
offering that sustains the life of this church and its work in the community and in the world. We share our non-pledged collection with an organization that is involved in making our community a better place. And this month, we are sharing with the UU Equal Exchange Program, which if you drink coffee downstairs, you know all about it. So ante up, please. We are grateful to you. And all gifts of any size, and even more, we're grateful for your presence here today at UUYO. Now we'll practice a little simple presence. Today's reading is a verse entitled Station by Lee Young Lee. Climb aboard because you're going to be going in and out of reality just now. Here goes. Your attention, please. Train number nine, the northern zephyr destined for river's end is now boarding. All ticketed passengers, please proceed to the gate marked evening. Your attention, please. Train number seven, leaves blown by, bound for the color of thinking, and renovated time is now departing. All ticketed passengers may board 
behind my eyes. Your attention, please. Train number four, the 20th century, has joined the wind undisguised to become the written word. Those who never heard their names may inquire at the uneven margin of the story, or else consult the ivy lying awake under our open window. Your attention, please. The music arriving out of hidden ground and endlessly beginning is now the flower, now the fruit, now our cup of cheer under branches more ancient than our grandmother's hair. Passengers with memories of the sea may board leisurely at any unmarked gate. Fateful members of the foam may proceed to Azalea. Your attention, please. Under falling petals, never think about home. Seeing begins in the dark. Listening stills us. Yesterday has gone on ahead to meet you. And the place in a book when a man stops reading is where the girl escapes through her mother's garden. And between paired notes of the owl, a boy disappeared. Search for him goes on in the growing shadow of the clock. And the face behind the clock's face is not his father's face. And the hands behind the clock's hands are not his mother's hands. All light-bearing tears may be exchanged for the accomplished wine. Your attention, please. Train number 66, unbidden song, soon to be the heart's full quiet, takes no passengers. Please leave your baggage with the attendant at the window marked your name sprung from hiding. An intrepid perfume is waging our rescue. You may board at either end of childhood.
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Daikin. Um, I'm a, among other things, I'm a Zen Buddhist priest and teacher, uh, based in New York at this point, um, and um, have founded a meditation group here in Youngstown, based here in the church, with uh, Reverend Joseph, who I've known for 10 years or more now. And In our Buddhist tradition, we celebrate the birth and the death of the historical Buddha, and also uh, an event that happened in his life, which is called his enlightenment experience or his awakening into what it is to be alive, what it is to be a human in the big scheme of things. And typically that happens on December 8th. That's kind of the, the day that's set aside for that. So this weekend, uh, starting on Friday evening and um, for many hours yesterday, we had a meditation retreat, which some folks um, who are present in the sanctuary here participated in. We wound up being like nine people in person and then about half a dozen people online as well. And The thing I like to emphasize with this, um, this stuff that has been created um, is that Siddhartha Gautama was a human being. And as the stories and the myths um, relate, he was born into a family. His father was the head of kind of the family clan we're not sure exactly what that looked like. Um, but he was, you know, his father was kind of the grand poobah of their family network. And he was very interested in having his son follow in his footsteps. So Siddhartha, when he was born, he was kind of trained in art and literature and history and politics and arts and all sorts of different things with the intent that he would take over for his father at some point. So he was, he had this very sheltered existence, um, very kind of cloistered and protected from, you know, the real world of what went on outside the family compound and within the, his experience. And then when he was about 35-ish years old, he wound up um, becoming curious about that outside world. And so uh, one of his best friends was the person who was in charge of the, the horses and the vehicles for the family, for the, for the clan. And Siddhartha started to kind of nudge his friend to take him out and show him what, what happens outside of the, the walls of the compound. And the friend said, no, I can't. I, you know, I basically work for your father and he wouldn't like that. So. But Siddhartha was persistent and eventually got his friend to take him out into the world in which um, Siddhartha encountered the reality of what it is to be a human being in a body. And on one trip, he saw a person who was elderly, which he'd never seen before. Everything was um, kept from him. And so all of his all the family and all the servants were all young and vibrant and, and healthy. And so Siddhartha went out and he saw um, an venerated, a venerable elder person walking. And, and then on, his, on another trip, he saw someone who was ill on the side of the road. And then on a third trip, he saw a funeral procession that they were taking a body to be cremated from the, in the Hindu tradition. And then on a the fourth trip, he saw this person who had been become a renunciate. He had given up everything, all worldly possessions and a home and stuff to go out to try to become closer to this spiritual um, aspect. And so all of this confused Siddhartha because he had never encountered it before. 
And so he came back and started kind of pondering and fretting and decided that he needed to figure out this, you know, new information. And so he, he snuck out in the middle of the night, um, left his, his home and his family and wandered around until he found that um, renunciate and talked to him about his confusion. And that person said, well, come and spend time with us and we'll show you these practices and different things that uh, will lead you to an understanding of the spiritual aspect of life and get you closer to, you know, at that point, you know, the, the Hindu um, pantheon. And so Siddhartha did that for a number of years. And then one day he, they subsisted on uh, donations, alms that they would beg for and people gave them food or money for them to support themselves and um, no, no, no shelter, no, um, no clothing other than this very kind of flimsy um, shawl that they had and so he practiced those austerities for a number of years and then one day when he was on begging rounds he fainted and uh, when he came to there was this young woman there who offered him milk from the cows that she was tending and um, his his friends, the people that he had been doing these practices with, came upon that and saw him and were horrified that he was indulging his physical body with um, something as uh, exotic as a bowl of milk. And so they basically shunned him and left. And so he was left there on his own and he resolved to, um, he kind of reviewed his life, this one life that he had known in his family where he had everything he wanted. He almost didn't have to say anything and tea would come or food would come or, you know, dancing girls or whatever, you know, kind of was available would just show up and he had, he did not have want of anything. And then he had this other life where he had renounced all of that and all kind of worldly um, stuff and possessions and experiences. And so he saw those two kind of poles that he had been, um, that he had experienced in his life. And he resolved to sit down and kind of figure out what is this all about and or perish in the effort. And so he, he did that. He kind of piled up a bunch of grass and sat with his back to a tree and started this kind of process of being present to this moment and whatever um, was unfolding, whatever he was aware of around him. And he did that for a long period of time, depending on the tradition, um, which denomination of Buddhas you talk to. There are one, some that are more kind of heroic than others, and, but he did this for a long time. And he sat through one entire evening, through the entire night, and in the morning he looked up and he saw the morning star. And he had this understanding, this realization, this awakening, that he was a cell. He was like one individual kind of constellation of matter and consciousness and awareness in this huge body of existence and that through his experiencing that he added to the uh, the entire the whole and he pondered that for a while and then he reached down and touched the earth and said i the great earth and all beings have this understanding. So it wasn't a personal thing. It wasn't like, woohoo, I've got it. Um, I've achieved this thing that no one else has. It was more kind of, I understand through my experience, this huge collective experience that everything is having. Everything is being and becoming in this moment, arising, and will eventually fall away and to be replaced by the next moment. 
And so that began this uh, practice of being present. And so all we do when we do a meditation practice is we kind of remove ourselves from the day-to-day -day of doing and the thinking and all of that stuff. And we just set ourselves aside and take some time, which could be three minutes or 20 minutes or whatever works in our day-to-day -day life to just sit down and notice what's happening, to be aware of our own physicality and what we hear, what we see, what we experience in this moment in order to kind of get out of our own way and let go of ideas that we have that it should be a certain way or it's always been this way. And by doing that, we can just settle into this moment and experience it and not have to react to it or judge it or like it or dislike it or run towards those moments that we like or run away from those things that we don't. And we learn this kind of deep abiding acceptance of this just as it is. It doesn't have to be different and on one level it can't be any different. Um, because all of these conditions arose for this to be just as it is. And so what we do with meditation or focus or we do it when we're singing a hymn or we do it when we're greeting our neighbors or we do it when we're driving our car is that we just open up and be present. And it's not some separate thing. It's not some like state that we get to where we have to kind of be in this altered state where I'm not thinking and I'm one with everything and those are just ideas, what it is, it's more like a present thing where we're just like, okay, I'm present to this moment and I see the light and I see the flowers and I hear this person rambling on and on about this stuff. And we're, we're with that. We're trying not to separate ourselves from whatever is happening in this moment and we become aware of how we, we do that, how we separate ourselves and we have ideas or we have likes and um, once we become aware of those then we can choose whether or not to um, continue that or whether we can just say, oh okay, I don't have to like this. I, don't, I can be a little uncomfortable, I can be very comfortable and it's okay. And so this idea of um, presencing and we focus on our breath just because that's one thing that we can do is we're just aware of ourselves as we're breathing here in this moment and inviting it all in instead of trying to make sense of it or trying to only look for those things that we like or we're accustomed to or familiar with. Um, and each of us have had that experience at some point in our life and we have this kind of continual understanding of what it is just to be in this moment. And there are certain things, you know, we lose ourselves in an activity and time goes by and it's like, where did the time go? And it's like, time is this another idea and illusion that we have, but we were totally present in something, in our work, in baking, in talking to somebody. And that, that kind of external of time goes away and we're just totally present. So each of us has had that experience of being part of this larger whole, you know, of being this drop of water in the entire ocean of reality. And so when we have that experience, then it kind of blurs that line between self and other because it's all we, it's all us just happening in this moment. And so the squirrel outside the window and I are having this moment together. And so it's not so much out there in here, it's all of it together. And so when we, when we do that, we it gives rise to compassion 
and loving kindness and this kind of balance, this equanimity of just being here without reacting. And that can change how we are in the world. That can change kind of how we interact, how we understand ourselves, how we experience ourselves, and then how we experience others. And we can be kinder. We can have less expectations. We can have less demands or less um, reactivity to all of this. And so this presencing is uh, an opportunity for us to experience that, to be just here in this moment and whatever's happening and have it be okay. I could go on, um, but uh, it's always a pleasure for me to come and to hang out with uh, the Youngstownians and uh, to share the space with you for a moment. So thank you all. You know, I have to say I was inspired uh, to make the title of this service Simple Presence based on an email I received. Uh, this person wrote something that really uh, captivated me. They said, perhaps simple presence is what really changes the world. Simply being present to one another. And it made me think that's what the Buddha really discovered under the Bodhi tree 2,600 years ago. Simple presence changes us. And it changes the world. I really like that poem. Thank you for humoring me, Sarah Lown, with that poem, Station. Uh, it plays with the idea that we expect to wait at a station to catch a train that's going to take us off to some other far off distant station. But the Buddha, 2,600 years ago, discovered another station. It is a station that brings us home. In some versions, I've heard of the Buddha's enlightenment story after much disappointment and being acutely aware of his own mortality, he decided to do, and this always stuck with me, he decided to do what came naturally to him as a child, as a small boy. He sat under the tree, just like he did once, as a small boy, before he thought about spirituality, before he thought about religion, before he thought about enlightenment, he sat there at the base of the tree and it just felt right. He felt at home. You can enter this station from either end of childhood. I like that line. He entered this station once, and he entered this station again as a man in his late 30s, knowing for himself the fragility of human life. He entered this station once again. According to the story, as, as Daikin mentioned, he sat for a while, and in my imagination, he sat so long, he lost track of the reason why he was sitting. That's my imagination. All the effort, reasoning, seeking, yearning, slipped through him on the in-breath and the out-breath. For a moment, he forgot what he was there to do. And that's in my imagination. And that's how the light from the star got through to him. He allowed the star to touch his heart. For a moment, he forgot who he was. For a moment, he was returned to who he really was. And he reached down, this is wood, so it's pretty close. He reached down and he touched the earth. 
This year, that's my favorite part of the story. For me, it means the wisdom we seek is not outside us. It's not some truth out there. It's here, in the heart. It comes up from the earth, through us, as us itself. It is life itself, which means it's our life right now. And that is an unbelievable story. Most of us, including myself, sometimes can't believe that what we most dearly seek is already here in our own life. And it's not just in my life. It's in your life, too. It's in a shared life beyond you and me. And the beautiful thing to me about this story this year is that it's not hard to access this experience. In fact, I think the reason why we think the Buddhist story is so special and rarefied is because we distrust how simple it is. Could it be, to quote a wise person in this congregation, could it be that simple presence is what changes the world. Simply being present to one another. Perhaps the station is here and we're always aboard and we can take the time to notice that. All here, together. And for a moment, when I get tired of trying and seeking The wreath is there. I see a sky of cloud and beautiful bare trees. At night, maybe I'll notice a star. And I spend enough time to let the starlight twinkle in me. I let another person's laughter baby noise, ga, 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 become mine for a moment. For a moment, maybe I can let another person's worry become my worry. For a moment. I could be prejudiced, but I don't think this insight is only for Buddhists. It's too good. It's too good to just be kept. This time of year, given the season, I think of things like gifts and miracles, and I always find my way back to the same feeling, that the greatest gift we can give or receive is the gift of presence, just being here for one another, feeling this life with each other. The greatest miracle is that in our awesome diversity, we can feel our connection intimately. That is a miracle to me. It's an everyday normal miracle. I have a great enlightenment story for you. I'm just making this up, but I think it could be a true story. <laughs> It's about to happen in a few seconds. Just feel yourself settle into your seat. It's okay if you doubt this. It's okay if you think this is crazy. Just settle in for a moment. Settle in. Allow yourself to feel presence of someone outside of you just to feel it. If you're really bold, you can turn to the left. Behind me. Did you 
enjoy that enlightenment. Every moment is a station to where we hope to get to. Every moment contains the possibility for connection beyond our imagining, beyond every thought that we have. Yesterday I was enlightened by a possum. <laughs> Thanks to Daikin. He showed me. He said, look, 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 look. I looked out the window at Kathleen's office and I saw in the leaves a white possum face and gray fur nosing in the leaves. And for a moment I forgot all my plans. For a moment. I was so entranced by this possum. And you know the greatest part of it is? I don't think the possum noticed me at all. <laughs> if he did, he didn't let on. He was just doing whatever the possum business is. <laughs> Nosing the leaves. Looking for food. I'm learning to trust the world as my friend. The whole world is conspiring to enlighten me. If I can be there for it. Maybe this has happened to you before. In the midst of stress or panic, all of a sudden, whew, baby, bird song, the smell of delicious food cooking. The world comes to our rescue, ah, saving me from myself over and over again without ceasing. I'm grateful this year for things falling through the cracks. I am. For my effort and resolve to hold things together, failing. <laughs> it lets the world in, even if it's accidental. Simple presence can be intentional. It can also be an accident. I trip and stumble into it. I fall into it. It falls into me. I stumble onto a train, a train I once rode in childhood, a time when the world and I met and I didn't bother to mark the meeting. There was no need for a victory lap, no shout of accomplishment, just a child and her tree, the great moon and a star shining, waiting for one person in all of eternity to take the time to notice. Please pray with me. Spirit of love, I'm so grateful to have Roshi Dyke in here. So grateful for everyone who made this service possible the sponsors with their beautiful music, Sarah Lown with her great passion and intelligence and decoration sense, which I don't have. Thank you to Tim Raritan for giving us a nice toasty sanctuary and sound, and Andy Crabb and Allison Crabb for being here in a wonderful presence. All as we pray in gratitude, and may we carry that with us as we have coffee and snacks together downstairs afterward. And may we be present to each other, to the wonder of a cookie, coffee, and a friend that we have yet to meet. All this we pray. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn. It's in the Teal Hymnal, Meditation on Breathing which I think I have here. It's uh, hymn 1009, 1009. I breathe in, 
I'll breathe in peace when I breathe it out. I'll breathe out love when I breathe in. I'll breathe in peace when I breathe out. I'll breathe out love when I breathe in. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out love. When I breathe in, I'll breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out love. When I breathe in, I'll breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I'll breathe. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the freedom of commitment. These we keep in our hearts until we meet again. As you depart, yeah, you can do it too. I see, I see one bird. You can bring it, do it too. It's for everybody. It's a democratic benediction. As you depart, <laughs> some people crack me up. They're just like, I'll, I'll kind of go with it. Okay. <laughs> As you depart, please remember the one great fact, especially during this holiday season. I need to hear this. Maybe you do too. You are loved and never truly alone.